Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. Before I introduce today's guest, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about our major sponsor, which is uh, Wondrium. W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M. Wondrium is the former great courses. I've uh, been talking to you about them for a long time. As you know, I have two courses on the Great Courses platform, one on Skepticism and 101, and then the other one on Conspiracies. And uh, But I'm just a long-time, lifelong learner and customer of the Great Courses now, Wondrium, because um, the lifelong education never ends. Um, the ending of your college education is just the beginning of your real education. And uh, as I predicted, mid-COVID shutdown, um, the future of education is probably going to change dramatically, and it already has. The consuming of online content as a supplement to college education and other forms of education um, is the wave of the future. It's where we're going, and I think Wondrium is the best platform for this. They have the great courses, of course, lots of different courses you could take, plus documentary films and series and just all kinds of great content. So if you just go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, you can get a month free trial. That's wondrium.com slash Shermer. So for example, you can get it on your as an app on your phone. There's that W. Boop, just touch on it. Opens right up. What I was looking for here was um, Shakespeare. I don't know much about Shakespeare. I've tried to read some of the plays. I have a hard time figuring out what's going on. I know next to nothing about English literature. So uh, when I type that in, here are the different courses I can take. Just on Wondrium. It's amazing. William Shakespeare, comedies, histories, etc. How to read and understand Shakespeare. Shakespeare's tragedies. And so on and so forth. Not to mention lots of related subjects uh, to that. So let's just touch on the one here. Let's go to Shakespeare's tragedies and see what it, it offers here. So, and here's what it looks like. Each of the lectures is 35 minutes long. And if you listen to them at 1.2 speed, you can get uh, through in less than half an hour. So you could do a couple lectures a day, just commuting, working, uh, working out, I mean, driving, cycling, hiking, walking, vacuuming the house. <laughs> uh, and it goes through all of them. Here it is, uh, defining tragedy, Hamlet, Hamlet 1, Hamlet 2, Hamlet 3, Hamlet 4, Othello 1, 2, 3, 4, King Lear 1, 2, 3, 4, Macbeth 1, 2, 3, and so on. Um, and uh, so that's a, it's a great deal. I, uh, I would not have a sponsor of this podcast if it wasn't a product that I used. So if you want to support the podcast, of course, always go to uh, our webpage where you download these things. Uh, and uh, and you can support us there, but more importantly, go to wondrium.com slash Shermer and give it a try. A month. You could do a course a week easily. Take four free courses, or you could just skip around because you don't have to take the whole course. You can just bounce around from course to course, lecture to lecture. I have to do that. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, and thanks for supporting Wondrium, and thanks for supporting the podcast. My guest today is Annie Murphy Paul, and her new book is The Extended Mind, The Power of Thinking Outside the Brain. Uh, so Annie and I talk about concept of the brain in a vat, which doesn't exist because it's in a body, and that embodied cognition makes a, a huge difference on our thinking and our intelligence, our reasoning. We talk about reasoning and emotions, we talk about intelligence and IQ tests, consciousness and the mind. And the brain, uh, memory synchrony, that is like things like marching and dancing and singing and even eating together. We tend to uh, get into synchronous motion with other people. Why is that? Talk about the evolution of this embodied cognition, this extended mind. That's a product of the fact that we're physical beings in a physical environment interacting with other beings, so we're social. Talk about interoception, interoception, that is the interstate of the uh, brain and body, how we are aware of our inner states, except for the brain, you can't detect how the, you don't detect the brain working, which leads to all kinds of uh, spooky beliefs like in the paranormal. Um, we talk about ADHD and autism as a form of cognitive diversity and, and uh, why those aren't disorders so much as just different ways of thinking about the world. We talk about metaphors in science, you know, the brain is a steam engine, the brain is a phone switchboard, the brain is a computer, is a parallel processor, is a quantum computer, and so on. 
Uh, we talk about rationality and irrationality, or to what extent uh, humans are by nature gullible or skeptical. Um, we talk about the smartphone as kind of extended mind. Uh, and then uh, we kind of wrap up talking about to what extent uh, different environments and different groups of people influence the way we think and, and how you can kind of structure your own world in a way that improves your own um, extended mind. So with that, thank you for listening. And as always, um, you, if you enjoy the podcast, you can support it by going to skeptic.com slash donate. Uh, this podcast is primarily supported by the Skeptic Society, and we are a 501c3 nonprofit, so your donations to the society um, are tax deductible, and that's how we support ourselves primarily. Um, so I appreciate your, your support if you could do that, and uh, thanks for listening. We're rolling. Annie Murphy-Paul, here's the new book, The Extended Mind, The Power of Thinking Outside the Brain. I will have already uh, provided a detailed um, bio for you, but uh, let me just start by saying now I understand, after reading your book, why I, I think why I do better listening to audio books rather than reading books. I can read books. I've read a gazillion books, but for some reason I can retain content and details, even quotes that pop into mind when I'm in a conversation. Uh, that I get from the audio version as opposed to the written version. So let's just start there. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question for you, Michael, which is when you think about those quotes from those books that you've listened to, do you remember where you were when you yes. were listening oh, to yeah. it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. This, this no, is the link to, to yeah. the extended mind idea. I can even picture, like, I, I'm usually doing this on a bike ride or a hike with my dog usually long bike rides. So I can remember like what Canyon road I was riding up when I heard this story about some story you told in your book. Yeah. So I can actually picture it physically where I was. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple things going on there. One is that, as you mentioned, you're moving when you're listening to these audiobooks. It sounds like you're taking a walk, you're taking a bike ride and movement enhances our thinking processes in ways that remain dormant when we're just sitting still, as we usually are when we're reading a print book. And then we also have this um, navigational, built-in kind of navigational system that marks where we are when we encounter important information. And you can understand the evolutionary value of a system like that. You, When you encounter you know, a, a source of food or a source of, of danger and threat, it's good to remember where that was so that you know to go to that place again or avoid it. And so um, it's so interesting to me how we limit the use of our own inbuilt sort of human resources, biological resources, when we remain still when we do our thinking. And yet remaining still while we think is kind of the way our culture thinks thinking should happen. Yes. It's really and, wrong -headed. And, and in reading the books, I can often remember where on the page it was like i'm trying to remember where that quote was i wanted to use and oh it was on the bottom left of the page and so middle of right. the book you know i kind of it could kind of a physical environment of the of the quote it's just words yes but yes I, and i think that's why reading on the internet or even reading a, on a kindle can be a rather disorienting experience because we have none of those physical cues you know like Oh, it was at the beginning of the book. So most of the pages were still, you know, to the right or whatever. The, those kinds of embodied experiences we have when reading a print book are missing when we read online. And I think that's why it all starts to <laughs> blend together and seem like this sort of miasma of information. Yeah, I don't do ebooks. Uh, I just, I mean, there's nothing wrong with them. I just can't, uh, just can't get into it. Also, I can't listen to a fiction, like a novel when I'm, you know, out on a bike ride or whatever. Because my mind kind of, uh, uh, you know, just spaces out for a few seconds or a minute. And with a nonfiction book, you can kind of come back in because there are chunks of ideas being presented sequentially. And I can kind of fill in the blanks that I spaced out on. But with a novel, I can't follow the thread of the, of the plot line or the character development when I space out like that. So I, I, I thought that was always interesting as interesting. well. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it is the case that moving our bodies consumes some mental bandwidth, you know. So I have a tell an anecdote in the in the book about the psychologist Daniel Kahneman and how he worked out a precise speed at which he could walk and think well, at the, and and found that that sort of moderate kind of intensity of exercise did enhance his thinking. But 
once he started to go faster than that, all thoughts kind of fled his mind. He was really focusing so much on navigating the terrain and he could no longer mull problems in his head as he was trying to walk too fast. Yes, and I remember that story because I was on a walk to the mailboxes. I live up in the mountains. It's about a mile walk to my mailboxes with my dog. And I remember thinking, because it takes me like 20 minutes to get to the mailbox, one mile. It's, it's mostly climbing. And he was doing like, what did you say, 15 minutes or 16 minutes for a mile? I thought, damn, that guy's 88 years old and he's beating me? <laughs> so there's a, another funny thing there, yeah. Yeah, so that's true because... Um, what I'm talking about here is only when I'm by myself. If I, when I meet the guys for a ride and we go pretty fast, I can't listen to anything, uh, it, you know, because it's just too, you know it's too too much concentrating on actually working working out something like that. But I do find the the entire idea pretty uh, pretty useful these days under the pandemic. We're all consuming content digitally now, often on you know online alone. And uh, but that has some trade offs, too, as you point out that, you know, but, but learning by yourself is not as good as in, in, a, in a classroom. So I, 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 I'm guessing you would make the argument that we still need brick and mortar buildings for universities and colleges, particularly seminar type uh, classes that in other words, the university is not dead. We're all going to Zoom and, and just consuming uh, university courses, no. you know, alone in our in our bedrooms. Yeah, no, I, I hope I hope the pandemic killed off that idea because we all saw how very impoverished of an experience that is to to do all your learning on Zoom. There's so much that's that gets missed. For one thing, the full range of people's gestures um, get lost when you're when you're on Zoom. The sense of social pre what psychologists call social presence, you know, that energizing alertness that we feel in the presence of another person. Those things just don't um, they don't come across in the same way in uh in zoom yeah especially if you have a conversation i tried this when the when the university's uh, chapman university closed down in mo early march of 2020 and you know that was it we, we we went to zoom and i was teaching a small seminar just 25 students and you know conversation kind of ricochet around the room sort of randomly and you, you kind of look for social cues and on Zoom, you just have to, you know, you put the little, your flag up, like I'm putting my hand up and it's like, this is just totally not even remotely as good. No, no. So I'm, I'm really glad that universities and, you know, K-12 schools are largely returning to in-person instruction this year. I think it's really important for people to learn and think and work together in, in person in the same place at the same time. Yeah, one other funny little anecdote I thought reading your book was the first course I ever had in college was an astronomy course. And uh, this is what got me interested in the sciences in the first place. But I remember the, when the professor was lecturing on each of the nine planets, there were nine back then. <laughs> that's, how, that's how old I am. <laughs> Pluto was still a planet. He would go and stand in a different part of the room for each of the different planets he lectured on. And I thought, this is really oh, interesting. weird. Yeah. But now I, I can remember yeah, oh, Ju Jupiter was over in the corner by the window and, over and there. Pluto was over there. Right. Yeah. And so that's what you're talking about, right? This, I don't know if that, that was interoceptive or just kind of the physical environment. Yeah. I mean, it gives the more hooks we can sink into a piece of information, the more ways we have to reel it in later on. So that the, the, literal position of your of your professor when he was speaking about the different planets i think gave your memory another another hook to to grab that piece of information with that's like that um that ancient greek memory system where you navigate through a room right. and you tag the words you're trying to remember to objects in the room or whatever and then you recount the list of words or the people whose names you're trying to remember at a party or whatever you know when you kind of replay in your head that journey through the house or the room or the palace of, I think it's the palace of memory or something like that. The, the memory palace. Yeah. Yeah. Because our, our brains didn't evolve to memorize lit, you know, sort of lists of information so much as they evolved to, in this case, remember where things are. And so the more we can leverage those evolved capacities that we all have in the service of learning and thinking, the better, the better we'll do. Yeah, I want to get into all that. I, I kind of unfairly just dove right into it with, with, before getting to know a little bit about you. Just give us a little brief biography, who you are and uh, what's your thing. How did you get into writing science books in general and this one in particular? 
Yeah. So, well, my first job out of college was uh, writing for my my university's magazine. And that's when I realized that I really loved talking to researchers, interviewing researchers about their quest to understand something. And then I then moved to New York and uh, started working for Psychology Today magazine. And I kind of further refined my my beat and realized that I really love to write about social science research in particular, because what's more interesting than, than people. Um, and then after that, I went freelance and started writing books as well as magazine articles. I wrote a book that was a cultural history and scientific critique of personality testing. And then a book that is about the science of prenatal influences. And then finally, this book about the extended mind or not finally, but late most recently. And, uh, Uh, To me, all of those projects are connected in the sense that I'm interested in what makes us who we are, like what, why, what the influences are that shape us. And the conventional answers to that question have never seemed that satisfying to me. So I've gone looking in other places, I would say. Oh, interesting. Right. Uh, Where'd you go to college? Uh, So I I went to Yale University and I live in New Haven now. So I'm I'm living in my college town after many years in New York. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. What do you but so on that topic, what do you recommend to, you know, young writers coming up now? The the landscape for writing has changed so rapidly uh, with the online, different various online sub stack uh, places where you can get paid to write, uh, depending on how many patrons you have or Patreon or you know, there's just, just a variety of ways you could try to make a living as a writer, but still it's a little difficult. Oh, it is difficult. And so for that reason, I would tell young writers to find a subject that they really feel passionate about, because at least for me, it's always been interests, my, my interest in something that's the engine that drives me on through the challenges of being a writer. And they are many, although there are, there are a really gratifyingly large number of places where a young writer can get published these days. But of course, the, now the, the challenge is getting your work noticed uh, in this, in this you know, huge sea of, of content that's available. But if you write about something you're passionately about, something that you're passionate about, I think it, the odds are that you'll find other people, other people who share that interest will, will find you and seek out your writing. And hopefully something relevant to what readers want to read about. The, the problem with the social media and the changing cultural landscape, it happens so fast. Like like right now, critical race theory and gender issues are all the rage. You know, there's articles every day I'm reading about this. But, you know, for a book, you know, it's like the you, you finish the book and it's a year before it comes out. It takes you a year to write. So that's at least two years. Who knows what subject you're passionate about now? It, you know, it's gone. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, another thing that's always been important to me as a writer is to say something fresh and something original. Like, there's no point in putting something out there that is tired and everybody's already heard, you know? So, um, although in the case of The Extended Mind, that idea has been around since 1998 when it was first proposed by these two philosophers, but it has never really reached the mainstream in a way that I think it really deserves to. So, I kind of think the moment for the extended mind to become more widely known is is now coming out of the pandemic after we've been kind of brains in front of screens for a year or more. And we can appreciate, I think, in a new way, how these mental extensions of the body and physical space and other people really do matter to our thinking. Especially with the introduction of smartphones as a form of extended mind, right? I mean, I oops, my, my light just came on there. Uh, I mean, I left mine in a in an Uber car the other day. Uh, it fell out of my pocket, and so you know, an hour later, I realized, oh my god! And, and oh, what am I going to do? Right. My all my phone—I don't even know my wife's phone number. I mean, that's pathetic, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you've off, you've offloaded that mental function to your phone to make more room for you know your your big ideas. So yeah, my big ideas, right? <laughs> it, it, it's it's fine as. Fine as long as you make sure you keep your phone with you, right? Yeah. But in a way, and you also talk about this, you know, we offload our information uh, uh, with our spouses or our friends or family members or people we hang out with, coworkers and so on. They're doing a lot of the work for us, and we kind of count on that in, in a simple way, like I have a calculator, so I don't need to do mental math because my calculator will do it for me. Right, right. Yes, I love that idea of transactive memory where 
no, no one person can know everything, especially these days when information is so abundant and expertise is so specialized. And so we have to rely on other people to hold in their own minds bodies of knowledge that we then have access to because we know where to go. We know who to ask, or, or at least that's how a transactive memory system works is, is by having a kind of very accurate and con- constantly updated mental directory of who knows what, say, in a, in a work team so that you know who to go to and who to ask and don't have to keep all that information in your own head. Yeah, yeah, very useful. Uh, and therefore the social nature of knowledge as well. Uh, before we get into the uh, more into the book, uh, The Cult of Personality, I was just thinking about this the other day, talking to a podcast guest about the nature of self. You know, and he was sort of arguing there is no self, there's no self-permanence of anything. You know, we just are constantly changing memories and so on. But I thought, well, no, wait a minute. Person, doesn't personality research show that certain characteristics are pretty stable over the lifelong? Like if you're shy and introverted, you can work at becoming a little more extroverted. But by nature, you, you just tend to be more on that, that, that left end of the spectrum of, 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 of uh, introversion, extroversion, if we use the big five. What, what is the research on that, about how stable those characteristics are? Well, I am certainly sympathetic to the view that people can change and that, that be, our behavior is often situationally determined and we act differently in different kinds of situations. But it is true that research, has, research suggests that there are certain basic dimensions of personality, introversion, extroversion being one, that are pretty stable, that emerge in childhood, you know, that have biological roots. Um, so I wouldn't want to say that uh, people are, that there is no, no such thing as personality or no such thing as a self, although that does, that's evocative of a kind of Buddhist perspective. I don't know if this guy was a Buddhist, but I, I find that, kind of. I find that idea yeah, quite interesting, sort of the pan-psych- idea of no self. Pan- panpsychist, Buddhist, kind of a Western Buddhist. Yeah, that there's no permanence to self, but uh, I mean, that doesn't feel right. I mean, I know there's a brain in the skull here and my skin, that's me. And I have memories of back to my childhood. And so I know they're always edited and changed. And I don't know if my memory of my fifth birthday is the one that my mother told me about when I was 10. And I have no memory of being five, you know, something like that. I know all that's true. But there's kind of a package within a wall, let's say a boundary of a channel that you go down. Like, like that's me, roughly speaking, a fuzzy, a fuzzy ball or something like that. Now, whether a personality test can accurately tell you who you are is another question. And that there I would I would say not really, you know, and I, I argue in the cult of personality that it's actually narrative. We actually construct our personalities up from narratives. And, you know, interestingly, you just referenced the story right there, that that story of when you were five. And to me, a personality in a self is made of stories more than its discrete categories as assigned by a personality test. What was that uh, personality test that that was all the rage for a while that had like 16 dimensions and you were, you, you had a, like an alphabet of letters? The, Ma- the Myers-Briggs. It's still the really Myers-Briggs. popular. And I it still is? hear, I still fe- oh, hear from God. people who, who feel that it has changed their lives. Yeah. that And that's a test that is utterly unscientific. So, right, right. But it's very, very popular. In business and dating sites, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in career counseling, that kind of thing. Um, people really seem to feel understood by it. It, it, um, you know, and I, I think, you know, take insight wherever you can find it. If, if this is helps you understand something about yourself, but know that it is not grounded in scientific research. Yeah. Cause the, but that narrative idea, you know, it's like, it's like Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief and death and dying you know, there's no such thing, really, stages that people go through. But it's a it's a story that you can kind of tell and think, all right, I'm angry, and this is why I'm angry, but I'm going to get over the anger, and then I'll, you know, then I'll res- be resentful, and then I'll be, then I'll be okay with it. You know, it's just kind of a way of thinking about it, whether it's true or not, in the scientific sense, it's kind of a narrative truth or a psychological truth for people. Yeah, or, or and a cultural truth at this point, because we've all been imbued with that notion that that's how grief is supposed to unfold. Yeah. So here I think about different truths, like truths that that for for me, like if I say meditation works for me, it makes me feel better. 
okay, good for you. You know, my headache went away, whatever. Uh, but but in science, we want something more than that, right? We want to say, no, it really works. You know, 60% of the people that meditate for one hour a day, six days a week of this particular set, you know, will have this improvement of their chronic pain or depression or anxiety or whatever. That's what, really what we're looking for. That's much harder to get. It is. It is. It's quite hard. And, um, you know, one of the value, one of the valuable things about science is that they often, it often, it often pushes back against our folk theories or our sort of intuitive understanding of how the world works. And that's why it can be hard to wrap your head around or hard to accept sometimes, but science, you know, often tells us something that we didn't know before. And that's why it's so valuable. Yeah. All right. So let's get into what it means to have an extended mind. I mean, we often just think like we are kind of a brain in a vat, a, a vat of cerebral spinal fluid. And, the you know, the, everything is up there. It's that's all there is. Well, that's not true. Right. I mean, I, I first I was thinking of I, I first cited that paper. You start off with that 1998 paper, The Extended Mind, uh, when I was writing about um, in my previous book, The uh, Heavens on Earth, about the attempts to achieve scientific immortality. That is, we're just going to upload a copy of your connectum to the cloud and, and you'll be there in the cloud. It's like, no, right. first of all, it's not just my brain. I need my body. They're like the cryonics people. You can get the cheaper version where they chop your head off and just freeze your head. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I want my body. I mean, uh, my brain extends yeah. all the way to my toes and, and hands. That's part of my thinking, my mind, right? Yes. Oh, that's the ultimate example of a brain bound uh, attitude where you all you need is the head and you can actually cut off the rest, which is totally wrong. <laughs> that's funny. Right. Why is that wrong? Why is that wrong? So, well, to start with that question of the body, I mean, uh, we do have this very deeply embedded idea in Western culture that the mind and the body are separate, that the mind is this sort of spiritual stuff, that it's rational, that it's it's it's. Uh, free from the sort of animal ins instincts of the body, and that that's that's a it's a cultural notion that's just not it's not supported by by science, and um, it's not supported by our daily experience either. I mean, we we move through the world with our bodies. We use our bodies to sense the world and experience the world, and we. We actually, you know, you can tell through the language that we use that we understand things in a, a grounded, embodied sense. We're always using, reaching for these metaphors. I mean, reaching for is actually an example. <laughs> yes. We we <laughs> use these, it's, you can't get away from it. We use these metaphors that take abstract or theoretical concepts, which the brain finds hard to deal with and puts them into embodied terms because that's how we evolve to understand the world. And so... The body is a, a just an essential part of thinking. It can't be separated from, from the brain. Right. So the hard problem of consciousness that is trying to explain how it is we're able to experience things like we are now just from neurons swapping neurochemical transmitter substances. They're just molecules, you know, just physical stuff. How, how is that possible? Well, part of the problem is, is you're using the brain to explain the brain or using the mind to explain the mind. Which which may not be possible. I mean, we can we can deconstruct a star or a you know a, a, an ecosystem or whatever using our our minds, but to use the mind to explain itself it, it adds a layer of complexity. Yeah, and I think that speaks to this metaphor that we often employ, uh, which is the brain as a computer. You know, and that was that's been a generative kind of metaphor, and it's it's produced a lot of interesting insights and research, but it's it's very limited in the sense that there's so many ways in which a brain is different from a computer. We're really more like animals than we are like machines. And that understanding that is is really key to understanding how the brain works and how thinking works. Yeah, I was I had Matthew Cobb on the podcast last year with his book about the uh, you know the mind mind metaphors, you know, going all the way back to like Descartes with these mechanical objects. You know, he was he was walking around some French garden with these mechanical ducks that were quacking and fountains that would go off. And he's like, OK, so maybe the little tubes of these neurons are filled with a fluid and they pump the fluid through there like a hydraulic system. So the brain is like this hydraulic water system. 
you know, from there you go to, you know, electric circuits in the late 19th century, you know, to, uh, you know, crude b binary computer systems with, you know, these little clacking devices that would go on or off, on or off, like, uh, like the Turing, the Turing test when Turing invented that massive room size computer. It, so it's like that. No, no, it's, it's the parallel processing. No, no, it's like a quantum computer. No, no, it's like, it's like, you know, what, well, what is it Whatever like? Whatever the latest most advanced technology as we compare the brain to that. Yeah. Now, now people compare it to the internet or yeah, it's, uh, we're always reaching for that metaphor and it's always inadequate. Um, it's always going to leave a lot of gaps. Do you think it's because you can't see it? You can't see the mind. It just invisible. <laughs> yeah. It's invisible. Right. And so we, we try to concretize it by, by reducing it to the brain, to this organ, you know, because it is hard, a bit hard to grasp the idea that, no, the, this, and this was the argument made by Andy Clark and David Chalmers in that paper we keep referencing that, no, the mind isn't, isn't limited to the brain. It's not sealed within the skull. It's actually distributed across the body, across physical space, across interactions with other people, and also uh, across our devices, our tools, and our technologies. And that's, it's, it's, um, it's not the way we're used to thinking about the mind, and so it can, it can take some getting used to. In fact, I I love the fact that that article, which is now one of the most cited articles in, in the philosophy literature, was rejected by three journals before it was really? it was um, finally accepted. Yeah. And when it first came out, it was really received with a lot of skepticism and even some derision, you know, and then and this was before the smartphone came on the scene. And once the smartphone arrived and people started to see in a very daily, everyday kind of way that they were. Uh, offloading some of their mental functions onto this machine, the idea of the extended mind became a lot more plausible. Yeah, you can't, I mean, I can see a brain. I know I have one, <laughs> uh, presumably, uh, but I can't, I can't sense it operating, right? So one of my explanations for apparent, apparently paranormal phenomenon is, you know, when people experience something like uh, hearing voices or seeing optical illusions or whatever, they're, they see it as out there in the world, or they hear the voices coming from out there in through the senses, because that's how it normally happens. I don't sense my neural networks firing away in the auditory tracks, creating this false uh, voice that's not actually out there. You can't sense any of that, right? So that, uh, you know, the first default position is, well, you know, there's something out there, you know, that's invisible operating these paranormal forces, ESP or something like that. So interesting. Yeah, that's, that seems like a very plausible mechanism for why it is that so many people believe in paranormal phenomena. Yeah, in part because the experiences are very real. I mean, as real as you and I talking now for people that have these like near-death experiences, I, I, take, I take them at their word that the experience they had is real. Of course, what we want to know scientifically is what does it represent? Does it really represent you're going off to this place? Well, my, my guest was this Bernardo Castro. He's a panpsychist philosopher and, and computer engineer. And so, so their line of thinking is that there's still something spooky about mind that the brain cannot, just analysis of the brain cannot account for. There's still something, this hard problem of consciousness. How do you make that transition? You know, I can, I can, we can determine the neural networks for redness or, you know, v visual stuff or hearing auditory voices or facial recognition in the temporal lobe, the fusiform gyrus and all that. But what it feels like to see a face and recognize, oh, that's that's Annie Ball. I recognize her. I saw, saw her, on her on her book cover. Right, that experience. How how do you explain that? Right. So a lot of a lot of people, they may not even be dualists. A lot of people I've been talking to, like him and Deepak Chopra, they claim they're monists. That consciousness is the ground of all being, and that the brain is just sort of an extension of the mind. It, it, it gets really wild from there. <laughs> You know, but there's still this, there's still this mystery that that mystery of consciousness that is a hard one. It is, it is, and it speaks gets to the heart of what kind of creatures we are. You know, which is is again kind of a, a thread that runs through all of my work. I think the extended mind, to me, the appeal of the extended mind is that it it's a more accurate way of understanding what kind of creatures we are. We are creatures that are embedded in a world. We're not, in, we're not isolated. We're not separate. We're really using all these resources from the world around us to do our thinking with. And to me, that's a very 
it's kind of an inspiring vision. We're actually connected in a way that we we don't always perceive because we have this individualistic kind of brain bound um, philosophy that dominates our culture. Right. So we live in a physical environment that you have to move around in, and that applies to all living organisms, all the way down to paramecium, who's just moving around in water, and it's moving along chemical gradients. It's looking for you know, light, so move in that direction. Dark, don't move in that direction, or this chemical is attractive, or this one's repulsive. And, and in a way, that's a kind of sentience, right? If you define sentience or consciousness as some awareness of yourself in an environment, well, then all living organisms are sentient in that sense. And the environment is such a key player in that creature's ability to navigate, to, to behave, to, to act on its, its goals, if we can attribute goals to it. But the, the environment is, is, not, you know, is not incidental to that, to that process. Yeah, so the entire body has to be part of the mind. It just has to be. That's how we evolved in, in a physical environment. So let's talk about uh, how you exactly. think about, uh, with the extended mind, how you think about like intelligence. Let's just start with that, intelligence and you know, IQ tests. You cite Gould there, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who famously worried about the reification of an IQ score as something in the head that's sitting up there. That's yes. my intelligence, right? And that's, there's a danger to right, doing that. Right, right. Yes, it can, be, it can be measured, it can be ranked. Um, it can be tracked over time. And those things are, you know, those ideas are embedded in our culture. They, they are at the basis, at the base of our, you know, our academic system, our system of college admissions and even workplace hiring and promotion. You know, we believe that people have this kind of almost like a lump of stuff, like a, a, a quantity of intelligence that's, that's inside their heads. It's either larger or smaller. And that's, uh, that's just how it is. That's what you have to work with. When, the extended mind offers a really different vision, which is that thinking, our, 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 the process of engaging in thinking is a, is a dynamic process of assemblage, that you're actually assembling and drawing on all these different resources at all times, and that the quality of the raw materials you have to work with actually helps determine how intelligent your thinking can be, which is a very different idea from the idea that it's all up here, all that matters is inside the head i'm you know uh, uh, with the in the extended mind i'm arguing that actually it really matters uh what kind of resources extra neural resources you have access to and there's there's no sense in which those resources are equitably distributed in our society so i end up talking about something i call extension inequality that there's an in addition to wealth inequality and income inequality there's another kind of inequality we should be thinking about which is the radically different kinds of access that people have to that, those raw materials of intelligent thought. Hmm, like, like what, like in a different neighborhoods, quality of a neighborhood or the schools or. Yeah, well, that's, that's one right there. I mean, the New York times ran an article a couple of weeks ago that showed how radically different um, tree cover in various neighborhoods is that uh, as very varying by, by income. I mean, it was, it was visually very striking that, some affluent neighborhoods were just lushly green and other, these were aer aerial photographs and others and uh, poorer neighborhoods were just barren of trees. And we know that exposure to the outdoors and to nature is a really effective way to restore our attention and to um, replenish our executive function, all these things that really matter for doing cognitive work. And yet some people have access to green spaces and other people don't yet, yet we we reward or punish people in terms of their outcomes, their what their output, without taking into account whether they're free to move their bodies, whether they have access to outdoor spaces or well-designed indoor spaces, whether they have access to uh, motivated, ambitious peers, and you know, informed, thoughtful mentors. All these things that really affect our thinking, and yet uh, they're not out here. They're not in here. They're out there. And so we have a kind of a blind spot for the role those resources play. So uh, inner city, urban environments are not going to have much greenerage, shrubberage, just by definition, it's just kind of the way, unless it's designed by architects, you know, which a lot of architects are trying to do, but that's going to take many decades before they kind of improve inner cities. So this kind of gentrification of people, wealthier people moving out 
of inner cities to the suburbs that are very lush and green. Yeah, I've never really thought about that. That would that that that, that would make a big difference for cognition. Just to be able to leave the house and walk around in a nice environment is huge. Not just for stress reduction, of course, but yeah, for cognition, that makes sense. What you do about that politically, I, we, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we recognize on some level that these things do affect our thinking because the value of mental extensions is really bit up high. I mean, it costs more money to live in a beautiful green space than in a barren. You know, we, we kind of know that these things are desirable, although we may not be totally conscious of the ways that they're affecting our thinking. Right. Those uh, New York City um, uh, condominiums or homes or whatever you want to call them, they don't have yards, you know, that are up, up, up on high stories looking out at Central Park. That's the, high, that's the, highest, rent, that's yeah. the highest rent in New York City, right? Looking you, at you Central Park. You pay a premium for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that right. does make a difference. I mean, you know, Ed Wilson talked about this back in the 90s with his biophilia idea. You know, that's something in our evolutionary history about like being higher up, looking down at like greenery, water, acacia trees, you know, that kind of thing uh, seems to be more appealing. And these aren't just aesthetic preferences. They're really survival instincts, you know, and we when we're in a setting like that, that feels protected and yet also gives us a wide vista for for looking out. We feel safe. We feel we have more mental bandwidth to, to think to think and to plan. And that's a very different feeling from feeling under threat or feeling exposed, you know, and so the place the place where we are really affects the way we think. Yeah, that costs money. I live in the California here in Santa Barbara, and the you know the the, the better view you have yeah, of the ocean, the, the, the higher the price the, of the house, and the and the and the beat right on a Hope Hope Ranch on the bluff overlooking the ocean. Forget it. I'm never going to be able to move there, right? So, <laughs> uh, but so the question is why? What what is the effect again? Not just you feel safe, but there's got to be something else. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a, a I don't know. It's I, I, I recall Carl Sagan's opening scene in the original 1980 Cosmos, where he's standing up. He's up on uh, Big Sur on the on the on the cliffs overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and he's talking about you know the cosmos is everything that ever was, is or shall be, and as we and and, and in slow motion the waves are crashing, and he says you know when you gauge the story, it's almost like falling from a great height, and you just sort of have this sense of awe and wonder and it's just wow and and and, and it's a very spiritual moment it, you know for a, a you know a hardcore materialist scientist to kind of wax poetic like that and that's one reason why he was so famous and that that series was the most watched series ever because in a way it like like a cathedral you know you go into a european cathedral my wife and i like to do these and, and i get the same sense of awe i do is going into an astronomical observatory like wow Right. And so those medieval right. architects right. must have had some sense of this extended mind. Like, you know, we're taking these poor people from these little mud huts and we're putting them in this space that's just awe-inspiring. And, of course, they're associating mm-hmm. that with God and the Creator and so on. But whatever, mm-hmm. it does evoke emotions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think those soaring spaces in the cathedrals were evoking that same kind of awe that we feel in vast natural settings. And I write in the book about how awe can act as a kind of reset button for the human brain. Um, as one researcher put it, it's like it shakes up our ideas of, of, of our, our normal schemas, ordinary, ordinary everyday patterns of understanding the world and gives us new, a glimpse of new possibilities, you know. And so nature and the vast majestic spaces of nature are, 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 is the easiest way to access that, that sense of awe. Yeah, so there. Let's talk about emotions and reason. Uh, you know, we we often think of the stuff we were just talking about as being kind of new age pabulum for the for the the weak people mm-hmm. who can't reason their way to use logic, <laughs> uh, and yet that's that's just nonsense, right? I mean, we all need to experience the kind of sense of awe and wonder. So, how do you think about emotions and reason with the extended mind model? That's really interesting. I mean, I I don't touch so much on emotion per se in the book, but I am interested again in the limitations of this brain as computer model. I mean, emotions are 
our mind's way of tagging things with significance for us. And, and we, we wouldn't have any way to make decisions or have preferences or make choices if we didn't have emotions. You know, I'm thinking of Antonio Damasio's work where he, he, he's worked with, with patients who've had brain damage where they're not able to access emotions and they can still think in a very logical, rational way, but they are utterly rudderless and adrift in terms of making choices because they have no way of distinguishing between one option and another. And so many of our emotions are based in bodily experiences in this capacity for what scientists call interoception, you know, the, the capacity to sense our internal signals. And although our culture encourages us often to override our body's signals or to, to push them aside in order to, to do our mental work. In fact, those signals can be a really informative source of, of wisdom and, and accumulated experience and information if we, if we are able to tune into them and, and be sensitive to them. Yeah, so explain that interoception. What is that and how does that work and how does that lead to the extended mind? Yeah, so uh, interoception is this capacity to feel the body's internal signals. And it's a fancy word that basically means gut feelings. You know, I think we've all had that sense of, of a, a feeling that doesn't seem to emanate from the brain, but that often does steer us in the right direction. And what that's about is that as we go through our, our daily lives, we're constantly we're taking in so much information, so much information that we can't keep it in our conscious minds. It's, it's instead it's, it's, it's in our, it's stored in our non-conscious mind and the way we have access to those stored patterns and regularities of experience is through the body. It's the body kind of giving us a little tug on the sleeve to say, you've encountered this, uh, this, scenario before. And this is, this is a, a sort of pointer for how to handle it. Um, and again, people who are more interoceptively attuned, who are more able to feel their heartbeat, for example, or to feel um, the racing of their, of uh, the, the uh, butterflies in their stomach or are more aware of their sweaty palms, they can, um, they can use that information in a finer grained way to make smart decisions and choices. And would, would that apply to the concept of multiple intelligences, like Sternberg's idea or, you know, or emotional, yeah, emotional intelligence or physical athletic intelligence? I mean, it, we use this word intelligence again, but it's just information coming in that we process in a way which has to also include physical information. So that would be your in, inner reception. Uh, how tuned you are to your body is a kind of intelligence because and then socially, how you interact with other people in a physical environment, that, that that's also a kind of intelligence. Some people are better at that than others. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we overvalue this kind of cerebral brain bound intelligence over the kind of intelligence that is located in the body. And you mentioned emotional intelligence. I mean, those interoceptive sensations can also help us understand how other people are feeling if we're attuned to how our own bodies are reacting, because you know, when we're speaking to someone, we're unconsciously and very subtly mimicking their facial expressions, their postures, their sometimes their gestures, and then we kind of read off our own bodies and in that way get a sense of what they're feeling. And so people who are, again, more interoceptively attuned, they can be, they are, research suggests they are more empathetic because they get a, a clearer and a more accurate sense of what the other person is feeling. And it's oh, the body that acts as that conduit. Right, right. Because when you're empathetic, say I'm or sympathetic, empathy, I guess would be the right word. I'm feeling somebody else's pain. Isn't there a neuroscience research showing that the same areas of the brain light up when I, I feel your pain, I see you in pain, the same areas of my brain are lighting up. So I'm literally, and literally who feeling are more your pain. In literally feeling your pain. Yeah. And, and people who are more interoceptively attuned report more intense feeling of feelings of pain when they see someone else being hurt. Yeah, here here we should invoke our our inner Bill Clinton. I feel your pain. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> but, but this is what politicians but, but this is what politicians want to do, right? They want to convince voters I I I I understand you. You should vote for me cuz I'm I'm right. I'm you. I'm which is part of Trump's appeal to that kind of middle of America people, the white 
uh, poor people that got left behind after the recovery of the 2008 meltdown, uh, they never got their 401ks back because they don't have 401ks, right? <laughs> so, you know, he comes along and says, you know, you got screwed and I'm going to, you know, I feel your pain, so I'm going to represent you. Yeah, that's a very common polit The politicians that are good at that, at least conveying that they're good at it, uh, you know, like the psychopath that doesn't feel empathy, but knows how to convince people that he does have empathy. You know, that's a kind of a, a, a sort of a perverse intelligence, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, there's a uh, an interoception researcher at the University of London named Manos Sekiris who uh, writes about what he calls visceral politics, and he's saying that you know our political pundits are so they're so intellectually oriented and they're always analyzing the strategy of various politicians in this very brain bound way, but the body is so involved in politics, especially these days. We know that people get very worked up, very emo you know emotionally and, and physiologically aroused around politics. And we really need to pay attention to what politicians, how politicians are interacting with voters' bodies. You know, I mean, it's really an embodied experience to engage in politics. Yeah, that was like that analysis after the 2000 election that Gore was too analytical, too eggheadish, too many charts and graphs. Uh, whereas Bush was like, you know, let's go have a, I want to have a beer with my constituents. Oh, all right. So he's just one of us. Yeah, that would be that. That would be what we would call, I suppose, social intelligence, something like that, which gets to what you're saying there. Yeah. Another one of my, another favorite episode of, I had of a Star Trek, the original series, where Captain Kirk gets, uh, he, they go down to the planet and, and then the, they come back uh, to the Enterprise and the transporter is not working. It never seems to work. Why they use this thing, I don't know. But it, it splits him into two. So there's the good Kirk and the bad Kirk. So, uh, you know, the, the evil Kirk is, you know, he's kind of belligerent and he's hostile. And, and then uh, astonishingly, this would never be made today. He sexually assaults Yeoman Rand, uh, you know, one of the employees on the one of the crewmen, crew people on the ship. And she fights back and scratches his face. And now you can tell the difference between the good Kirk and the bad Kirk because the bad Kirk has the scratches on his face and so on and so forth. But then it turns out then there's some assault on the Enterprise by the Klingons or whoever. And the good Kirk is sitting there and he can't make a decision. I don't know what to do. What should I do? And, uh, you know, Spock is like, well, we should be able to just reason our way to this. And Dr. McCoy, is he's the emotional one. And, and in a way, Roddenberry kind of se separated them. He has, you know, Spock is the purely cerebral. Uh, Dr. McCoy is the purely emotion. And, and Captain Kirk is like the blend of the two. So at the end of this episode, uh, you know, McCoy explains to Spock, he needs good Kirk. He needs the bad Kirk inside of him to drive him to make decisions. Now, of course, you know, don't endorse sexual assault or whatever, but that that kind of emotional push, uh, you, uh, that, like Demacio's research, just you know, sitting there in, in the aisle looking at all the different toothpastes and analyzing them, you know, price and you know, what flavor, whatever. It's just I don't know. I like the blue one. Okay, boom, done. Right. You just have to, that's an emotional. Right, right. So emotions drive our decisions, and in a way, you absolutely have to have that. Yes, and they provide that shortcut that says, I, d I don't know why I just like that, so let's go with it. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So, you know, Kahneman calls these heuristics, diverse King Kahneman, we should say, you know, as, as cognitive shortcuts, because no one has the time to do, you know, complete analysis of that. So I did want to ask you about that, because you have a lot on Kahneman in there. I love Kahneman. I just had him on the show, 88 years old, and he's still sharp as can be. Oh, it's amazing. Okay. Uh, but, you know, there's Amazing. been this long debate where, you know, it, it, like in my business of skeptic, you know, if you study what I study, it seems like humans are just totally irrational, you know, crazy, believing all these QAnon conspiracy theories and aliens are visiting all this stuff. It's like, what is wrong with humans? And then you read Kahneman and Tversky, it's like, oh, OK, yeah, we're just irrational. Look, we can't think, you know, reason very well. But then someone like Gert Ginger and Zerk comes along and says, no, no, all of these uh like the Wasson test you write about. These are all artificial logic puzzles. We didn't evolve to solve logic puzzles. So like in the Wasson test you talk about, well, just walk us through that. What's the story with the Wasson test and, and why are we not good at solving that? Yeah. So the Wasson test is exactly that kind of tricky little artificial logic problem that you mentioned, wherein uh, your people are shown a series of cards and then they have to uh, say if, if it, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact wording, but it's like, how many of these cards would you have to turn over to, to, re, to reach a desired result? And when presented in this very abstract, conceptual, detached kind of way, people do terribly at it, even very well-educated people, even people who've been 
educated in rhetoric and argument and logic. So it we really just we, it looks like humans are really stupid, you know, when when you as a, as a as a species when you when you apply this test. But when you change the wording of the test, you keep the the task the same, but you put it in terms of a social problem, and you say these these cards represent people who are at a bar and they can't drink unless they're 21 or over. And, uh, you know, how many of these cards do you have to turn over to know whether this person can order an alcoholic drink or not? People ace it. They, they, their performance immediately, um, improves just because the problem has been made social and it's, it's social problems that humans evolved to solve. And we're really, we are quite good at it because we evolved to solve problems in these small social groups. And especially some evolutionary psychologists would argue, especially to detect cheating or sort of violations of rules, which, which this touches on. So yes, Kahneman would say that, um, that our brains are flawed by these kinds of, of um, the, they have these built in cognitive biases and, and flaws, but uh, other others, and I'm thinking of um, the cognitive uh, psychologists, Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber have said, no, it's just because this is reasoning taking place in a context for which it didn't evolve. And when, when reasoning takes place in the context for which it did evolve, which is social, people can actually uh, reason quite well. And so it's it's the thinking alone, which often is how thinking is done in our society, that is the problem. Yeah, you you wrote about the uh, the Enigma of Reason by Sperber and, and Mercier. I love that book. You know, that reason, reasoning, our ability to reason, I should say, evolved not to understand the truth about the physical world so much, although that's got to be part of it, uh, but that to convince others uh, that we're right about our interpretation of the physical world. Right. And so that's why we are so good at, 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 we can be so good at identifying the weaknesses and flaws in other people's arguments, but we're so subject to confirmation bias when looking at our own arguments, we, we are very bad at, at identifying the flaws in our own arguments. So we should really, as, as a result, we should really rely on other people to do that for us and we can do that for them. Yeah, I had Mercy on the podcast last year. I loved his book, uh, uh, Not Born Yesterday, his sort of sequel to, to the uh, reasoning enigma. Uh, in, in as much as that, uh, it, it made me course correct about how I think what we should be doing at Skeptic Magazine and Skeptic Society, or larger, you know, the teaching of critical thinking, you know, educating uh, the populace to be able to vote rationally and these sorts of things. Because the assumption has been that, you know, we're just idiots and, and, you know, we just need to teach people, you know, you know, what to think about things or whatever. And Mercy kind of shows, actually, we're not that gullible, you know, because I'm always writing about cults, right? And everybody knows the examples, Jones, Jonestown and Heaven's Gate. Look, you can get people, are, people are so gullible, you can get them to drink the Kool-Aid or literally take their lives so they, they can go to the spaceship. But Mercy points out, actually, most people don't join cults. Right. And so I was thinking, yeah, right, that's right. There's right, like right. Uh, there must be 10,000 self-help groups in America, whatever you want to call them. You know, the Tony Robbins, you know, uh, you know, let's all go f walk on hot coals and cheer and chant about uh, positive thinking or whatever. And you go home and you're, you know, you're you're fired up or whatever. Those people aren't going to kill themselves. They're not joining cults. Right. And, 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 and so actually, we're not that gullible. So I was actually kind of encouraged about that. Like, OK, may, maybe, uh, you know, there's some hope that we can you know, get to a more rational society if we just figure out how to do it. So those debiasing programs, like you take Kahneman and Tversky's list of uh, cognitive biases. I don't know if you've ever looked online. I think Wikipedia has like 250 different biases. It's it's amazing we can even read anything or even get out of bed. We're so flawed, seemingly so flawed, and yet we do, <laughs> right? Right, And uh, right, right, right. We managed to do some pretty impressive things given our, our faulty mental equipment. <laughs> Yeah, and I was thinking about this, my next book's on conspiracies, conspiracy theories, rather uh, relevant these days. You know, I just saw a poll yesterday, 29% uh, of, of Republican voters think Trump will be back in the White House this year. Astonishing. Two thirds think the election was rigged, even though A.G. Barr himself, the, you know, the attorney general, you know, the very definition of a conservative Republican Trump supporter said no fraud. What are these people thinking? You know, well, I, I, I think the conspiracy theory itself is not what's important. It's, whether that's true or not is sort of beside the point. 
there's something else like tribal loyalty. You know, there's this, this larger conspiracy. We don't trust Democrats or the libtards are trying to do bad things. They're trying to make America a communist country, whatever, you know, and that the details like, do you really think Hillary's running a satanic cult in pizzeria in Washington, D.C.? They can't possibly believe that. Who would believe that? Well, one guy did. He went there with his gun. He went there with his gun and he's, where's the basement? And they said, we don't have a basement. What? <laughs> <laughs> so he shot into the roof and then he got arrested. Anyway, fortunately, no one was hurt. But that guy at least had the courage of conviction. Mercier makes the point about that particular story. That's what you would do if you really believe there was, you know, a, a crime being uh, you know, unfolding before your very sure. eyes, and no, no one's doing anything about it. Right. But what most you, people do is in that, act. in that particular case, they went online and left like a one-star review of the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria. It's like. That's not what you would do if, if you really believe, uh, right? If you really <laughs> thought, right, 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 right. Michael, in your book about conspiracy theories, do you, is it part of your your sense of why they, they have taken root and thrived that our world is so complex and, and conspiracy theories, by contrast, are so satisfyingly, you know, relatively simple and they they organize the world for people who believe in them? Yes, absolutely. That's a huge part of it because mostly... The fact of the world, the world is no one's in charge. You know, no one's running the economy. You know, no one. I mean, even professional economists. You know, it's why is gas price prices going up? I mean, this guy says this, this person says that. Who knows? It's like, how can that be? But there's twelve guys in London called the Illuminati, and they are the Rockefellers, <laughs> the Rothschilds, right, the, right. the New World Order. You know, they're running the show. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's a, you know, that's cutting, more through satisfying, the, I yeah, think. cutting through the chaos, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that that is part of it. Also, uh, again, this kind of proxy truth. It's a stand-in for something else. Uh, whether that, you know, like if I convinced you, a hardcore Trump supporter, that Hillary's actually not running a, a, a you know, a, a satanic cult, the Clintons are not murdering people and so on, you're not going to go, okay, in that case, I'll vote for Hillary. You, you were never going to vote for Hillary. Right. So it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. It's, it's sort, sort of a, a mythic truth. Right. And uh, I think this goes a long way to explaining like re- a lot of religious beliefs. They're not empirical truths, whether Jesus was resurrected or not. Where's the control group? I mean, how are we going to test that? Right. It's just sort of an article of faith. If you believe it, you're a Christian. If you don't, you're a Jew or Muslim or whatever. And uh, and, and yet people passionately believe in it, but not for empirical reasons, for some other you know, so, so sort of a proxy truth for some other thing. Like, this is how I define my my moral world or something like that. And this is why you get these kind of, kind of passionate positions on abortion or, or you know, immigration or whatever. Those specific issues are standing in for something larger. You know, this is my worldview. It's a Christian worldview. You know, I think there should be a hierarchy in society. And I think, you know, all life is sacred, except for the people on death row and the people in the country we're invading. <laughs> okay, I'm being kind of sarcastic here. <laughs> but, you know, you get what I mean. So, you know, the abortion issue is a stand-in for something else. You know, I, I define myself as somebody who, you know, agrees that the Bible is the road to truth and Christianity is the right religion and so on. So even if I talk you out of being pro-choice, pro-life, and, and convince you that the pro-choice position is slightly better— uh, whether you come around or not is, is not going to really affect your larger, deeper uh, beliefs. And so drawing the line there is kind of how it happens, I think. Anyway, I'm, I'm kind of riffing on how I've been thinking about these things. Yeah, Because yeah, really atheists tend to think, well, if we can just show religious people that the cosmological argument or the fine-tuned argument for the cosmos is not true, it's, it's, it doesn't prove that there's a God. They'll be atheists. I'm like, I don't know if that's going to happen, actually, because I don't think they're religious for those reasons in the first place. They didn't come to their beliefs because they heard some clever argument by a theologian about, you know, what the, the origins of the universe or the fine tunedness or whatever. That's that's not why they're religious. Yeah, that makes sense. Very interesting. I mean, I, I argue. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to, well, I was going to transition to, say, uh, go ahead, no, but please finish that thought. Just that um, one reason that the extended mind is so, I think it's so important and so relevant right now is that the world has become so complex and there, and, and that, that information is so abundant that it's really kind of 
um, we've reached the limits of what the biological brain on its own can do. So the only way for us to to cope with or manage the complexity of our world is to draw on these external resources to enhance the brain, to allow the brain to kind of overachieve because the biological brain is really not equipped for this incredibly complex world and culture that we've created for ourselves. Do you see any directionality to human history along these lines? I don't know if you know Teilhard de Chardin's 1950s book about what he called the new sphere, N-O-O sphere, uh, which would we would describe as the internet, right? This is way before the internet, but he had this idea, if you, if you take you know, this extension from writing you know, to media, television, radio, and so on, pretty soon we're all going to be this sort of global mind, you know, all interconnected, which is like what neurons are. So, you know, that this is the metaphor, right? That, you know, yeah. we're all like part yeah. of the internet is like a mind. And, and, and you know, so, some people like Robert Wright in his book, Non-Zero, make this argument that there's kind of directionality to history moving in that, you know, kind of social complex, what Gilhard called a new sphere, but we, we would call it, you know, the, the inner, inner, internet or some worldwide web mind that could at some point become sentient or conscious. I mean, it's kind of science fiction here, but it's an interesting idea. It is. Yeah. I, I do think that we need new practices and new structures for thinking together because we're, we, we are educated in ways of individual thinking and we value individual achievement and performance in our society, but we, we don't, we're not really trained to think in groups. And so a lot of our thinking in groups is haphazard or not intentional and, and therefore unsatisfying and ineffective. And so I think, um, you know, things like, um, crowdsourcing and the hive mind are, these are really sort of disembodied ways of, of thinking together often online, but I'm more interested in how does a group of people come together in a room and think together such that the group mind is more than the sum of the individuals that make it up. Right. So let's talk about the research on that. Um, you know, how, if we want to have, have a group of people working together to try to solve a problem, what's the best way to structure that group? Yeah, well, one of the problems that often arises when people think together is that all of the individual information possessed by, by the people in that group doesn't get shared. And in fact, people tend to share the information that they already have in common. It's, it's a really well-established finding of, of organizational research. And one of the reasons is that we like to feel connected to other people and we, we don't like to be the outlier who's bringing in that piece of information that may be unsettling to people or unexpected. And so we, we end up, uh, you know, this is what groupthink is all about, that we, um, that we end up uh, often following the lead of, of the, the, more, the more powerful people in the group. And then others who may have really vital information engage in what Cass Sunstein, the, the Harvard professor, calls self-silencing. And often it's, it's people who have less education or their l lower status or there are people of color or there are women who engage in this kind of self-silencing. And so his solution for that is to have leaders actually voluntarily engage in self-silencing, that they should be, they should, they should go last, you know, because when the, the leader comes in and says, okay, this is what I think, what do you guys think? <laughs> you know, that's the setup for, uh, for groupthink and for people just contributing um, to the consensus rather than challenging it. Yeah, Sunstein did that research on group dynamics where uh, if you don't have a diversity, uh, you know, viewpoint diversity, uh, you're going to end up with groupthink. They just kind of naturally all migrate toward one position. So you have to enforce that. I remember in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis in the that film 13 Days, uh, you know, Bobby Kennedy says, Jack, you can't be in the room. You know, we we gotta we gotta let the you know the, the you know the heads of the different departments speak their mind, and if you're in there, they're they're not gonna they're gonna be afraid to say something. You know, and then I I'm, I'm right. I was thinking of uh, Doris Kern God, Godwin's book uh, Team of Rivals about Lincoln, you know, hiring and it, putting in his cabinet members of the other party or people that opposed him within his own party. Although I saw a recent analysis of that that all those people end up quitting fairly quickly. You know, like within the first six months of his administration, because that's really hard to do. Oh, interesting. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's hard that, to maintain. Yeah, that's is. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> good, 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 good while it lasted, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
one of those replication <laughs> yeah. crisis yeah. stories probably that doesn't replicate very well. Right. Well, but that's the idea <laughs> right. of view, right. viewpoint, right. viewpoint diversity is, you know, n none of us are smart enough to figure it out on our own. And therefore you need other people, uh, if for nothing else, to bounce your ideas off just to see how they sound and then to push back, the whole point of peer review, right? And uh, but the problem is, of course, none of us like hearing that. You know, it's hard to hear it, and it's hard to get people to actually speak their mind. So I'm worried about the cancel culture movement. You know that students, like my students, they all self censor. I ask them, "Do you self censor?" Of course, I'm afraid to say anything about this or that. And uh, you know that that's also not good. Yeah, I think again, these are these questions of how to think together in groups are too important to be and too complicated to be left to kind of this haphazard, unstructured approach that we so often we throw a group of people together and we tell them to work it out, you know, and often the results are not what we would want them to be. And so I'm really interested in those industries where the kind of work that people do is so complex and so demanding that they've had to develop structured ways of interacting, like computer programmers, for example, some of them engage in pair programming where two people are working incredibly closely together. They really are a group mind. Uh, or there's um, various kinds of um, approaches to working on a project uh, like Agile and these kinds of, um, you know, people scrum programming and these kinds of things where people in, in programming have developed really structured ways of interacting with each other, thinking together. And I think the rest of society may eventually have to follow their lead because the way we engage in group thinking right now in, in, in the rest of society is, is so loose and so unstructured and so ineffective. Yeah, if you look at uh, like Solomon Ash's famous experiments on conformity, where you, you know, have a room full of subjects, only one of which is a real subject, the other are shills, and they're showing three lines and a matching line. And everyone in the room but the real subject, you know, picks the obviously wrong line, then uh, it was like two thirds of the time the real subject picks the wrong line. But if you have just one or two other people before he goes that pick the correct line, then they're, you know, the, the, the conformity plummets, right? You know, so there's, there's the, the, the value of having uh, the opportunity to voice your opposition to the prevailing, you know, wisdom of, of the day or whatever. If only just a few Republicans would stand up and say, this rigged election stuff is bullshit, and I'm not going to stand for it. Liz Cheney did that, right? I never thought I'd hear myself say Liz Cheney's my hero because I'm not a conservative. But wow! But look what happened to her, right? She's she's gone, you know. So that's the right, power of right. a, a strong leader like that. It's just, but it it doesn't take you know two thirds of Republicans. If just you know maybe a dozen or so that are in in in, in the Senate stood up and said, no, we're, we're not going to do this. Then the others would kind of, I think, fall in line. Yeah, again, we like to think of ourselves as individuals, but these social pressures are really so, so powerful. And I see, I think we see that playing out in, in our politics. Totally. I mean, they're, they're all just so afraid of Trump speaking out against them that they'll be, well, there's now a verb for it. You'll be primaried. Trump will, in the next time you're up for election, Trump will endorse your whoever your, your opponent is, in your own party, and then you're out. And so people just go, okay, I'm going to keep my mouth shut on this rigged election business. So that's why I'm not really sure the polls are correct when they say, you know, do you think the election was rigged? People, yeah, I think so. And they tick the box. I'm not sure they really believe that, uh, you know, but they're, they're afraid to speak out of something like that. So that's the point of uh, viewpoint diversity. Okay, let's talk about music, dancing, all this syn synchrony. What is synchrony and 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 why did we evolve this capacity? Yeah, I love the, the the literature on the power of synchronous movement to unite people because it again it's kind of it taps into this very visceral, very embodied, very um, almost primitive kind of mechanisms that humans have evolved to connect with each other, to think as a group rather than as individuals. And you know, um, you can see the the power of synchronous movement used by militaries and churches and organizations of all kinds, we have these rituals that involve people making the same motions at the same time or celebrating in ways that involve synchronous movement like dancing. And it really 
uh, there seems to be some very primitive um, mechanism in the brain that's tapped by synchronous movement that in which you kind of feel like, well, my my limbs and my body are, are moving in the same way at the same time as that other person's. We must be in some way, we must be united in some way. We must be one one entity. And then that allows us to think together more efficiently and more effectively. And so, again, that's why I think being... Um, together in person and sharing rituals, even s- simple rituals like eating a meal together are so important because that's a loose kind of synchrony where you're, you, you know, you're eating, you're kind of mirroring the, 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 um, the uh, motions of the other person in a way that makes you feel connected to them. And one of my favorite pieces of research in that realm is that when food is really spicy um, and you're, you're experiencing that physiological arousal with other people, and when it's served family style so that you're actually eating from the same dishes, those those conditions kind of amplify the effect. Interesting. So we should all be yeah. going out and eating <laughs> spicy food family style together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this answers the question why the military would have soldiers marching. I mean, we haven't marched in 200 years into battle. It's just not how it's done. But there's another no. reason for it. Exactly. It serves the function of, of creating that sense of group identity through, through ta- hacking almost this sort of physiological uh, mechanism. I do think there's an element of that to why people are religious. Um, you know, there's this, again, this idea that atheists have like, well, they just have bad arguments. And if we correct their bad arguments, they won't be religious. If you, you only have to go to church, particularly like uh, some of these mega churches, you know, these evangelical churches we have here, particularly in Southern California. I've been to a few of these traditional black churches in the South. Uh, back in 1996, my buddy Michael Coles was running against Newt Gingrich for uh, Congress in this pretty, pretty uh, red area of, of Georgia. And uh, anyway, we went to, on that Sunday before Election Day, we went to Martin Luther King's old church. And I've never been to a black church before. And it was an eye opener. I mean, this wasn't anything like my boring Presbyterian church I went to as a as a child, which you just sit there quietly, you know, trying not to fall asleep. I mean, this was singing and dancing and up and down and holding hands and cheering and and reaffirming everything the preacher is saying. Oh, amen, brother. That's it. Oh yeah. Oh, you know, and so on. It was like, holy crap, this is a show, right? This has nothing to do mm-hmm, with mm-hmm. you know rational and a, arguments. A, a participatory <laughs> experience. Yeah, I mean, the, it was a show, but also the the congregants participated in it, it sounds like. That, that's right, yes. And the Pentecostal churches are like that. We, I went to one uh, years ago in, in uh, Orange County. It was a Korean Pentecostal church. And this is, you know, the, I don't know if you know the Pentecostals. These are the ones that speak in tongues. Uh, you know, they have healings right there. You, know, you just come on up and we're going to heal your, your leg or your lungs or whatever. And, uh, oh, my God, people were writhing on the floor, and it, it, it looked like agony or ecstasy. I don't know what it was. <laughs> and uh, But, but you know, and so, you know, when the preacher called people forward, you know, they're kind of lined up, uh, you know, like this, and here he's over here. And everybody could see that this person, as, you know, he comes up to touch them, you know, they're kind of getting wobbly, like, like, you know, they're just falling into the role. He, if you want to call it a role, you can kind of a role playing or modeling what you're supposed to do. But, you know, he would just touch them on just like boop, boop, like that. And boom, they'd fall over. And, and he had a couple staff members that would catch them. So they don't smack on the floor. Right. So everybody kind of right. kind of see what was to, to happen. But you kind of get that feedback loop going. It just got more and more emotional and the emotions in the music and the lights and the flowers, the whole thing. I mean, it was really quite not cerebral at all the very opposite is totally extended mind of you know all the physical body and, and the and the physical environment of the church itself yeah yeah so that is quite a powerful experience and not at all one that would be one would be dissuaded from by an intellectual argument right so i i think part of the evolution of religion is what you're talking about with the social and extended mind extended mind into to social groups that's what it's for right it doesn't matter which religion you belong to. It's belonging to some group, what, you know, Putnam calls so- social capital in his book, Bowling Alone. You know, that, you know, he sees this as a crisis in America, of this isolationism, this individualism. You know, I don't need anybody. I could do it on my own. No, that's not true. And, you know, that even, even a bowling league, just being a member of a bowling team sounds 
crazy now, but that was big in the 50s, right? But whatever it is, you know, I belong to a bunch of psych, a cycling group, right? And, you know, those are my buddies. We're out there together. You know, I think that's part of human nature. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And it's um, something that's often missing in our schools and workplaces. And yet it's such a powerful resource for solving problems and thinking effectively. And so it's too bad that we tend to view our social natures, our so natural sociability as something apart and sometimes opposite to, you know, learning or, or working and something that has to be put aside and saved for after hours when really we should be leveraging our social natures in those spaces with things like social activities, like storytelling and arguing and debating and teaching other people, you know, the more we can leverage those social activities in the service of learning and working, I think the more effective our thinking will be. Didn't you write about in the book um, the the decline of recess for children in in, in grammar school? I do. I yeah, do. I mean that's. I a, do. Yeah, they need that, right? They need that for a couple of reasons, right? The social piece and also just that physical movement. And it's so wrongheaded to assume that if you want children to perform better academically, what they need is more seat time. You know, more time sitting still and focusing and concentrating. Actually, you know, those are really limited resources that get consumed very quickly. And what kids need is to replenish their ability to pay attention and to control their impulses by blowing off steam in the in the courtyard and or the, the playground. And that's what recess is so perfect for. So I, I'd love to see more recess, not less. Yeah, definitely. So and here I was in that section of your book, I was thinking about the evolutionary psychology debate about to what extent things like dancing, music, aesthetic appreciation, and so on, are adaptive uh, functions that we have. They, they, in other words, they, they evolve for adaptive reasons, or if they are what Steve Pinker calls uh, cognitive cheesecake, right? It's just kind of a, <laughs> yeah. or, or Gould would call a spandrel. It's just an accident of some other thing. I think your argument would be in favor of the, there's an adaptive purpose to this music, dancing, rhythmic, you know, aesthetic appreciation. But what are your thoughts on that? For sure, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I see it as adaptive. And one of the best ways we have of bridging the gap between people and creating a kind of cooperative spirit, a spirit of uh, of wanting to help each other and of being on the same page, you know, I mean, that is um, the challenge when we are all these individuals with our own perspectives and our own points of view. To effectively work together, we need to be in, we need to have a shared kind of model of reality and a shared sense of of how to work together and and those kinds of very basic human activities like making music or dancing together or um, even walking together. Um, you know, when people walk together, they tend to fall into a synchronous rhythm. And so um, again, just the idea of, of that all our work should be done sitting still at our desks or around a conference table is really at odds with with the reality of human nature. Again, moving a physical body in a physical environment with other people. So this uh, gets to, right. um, uh, you wrote about ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder, and then we can throw in autism and the spectrum and all that stuff. Jeffrey Miller calls this cognitive diversity, right? These are just different ways of engaging other people in the world uh, cognitively, uh, although we treat them like it's a disorder and we need to give them a medication or some kind of special treatment. So how, how do you think about those issues and the extended mind? Yeah, well, you know, it for all of us, uh, not just those with uh, an ADHD uh, dis diagnosis, um, you know, we're really meant to move. We evolved to, to be moving our bodies, even in small kind of micro ways all the time. So to sit still, especially for long periods, it actually takes up a fair amount of cognitive bandwidth to to inhibit that impulse to move. And especially for kids who have attention deficit disorder, they actually, research has found that they actually need to move. They think better when they're moving. And it's a matter of modulating their level of arousal, you know, just like an adult might drink a cup of coffee before tackling some difficult assignment. A kid with ADHD may need to move around to kind of get themselves in the right state of physiological alertness and arousal to focus. But so often parents and teachers have this idea that You've got to sit still in order to think when really many kids need to move in order to think. And so that's where 
um, I think fidgeting can come in. And I think it's really interesting that there's such a, a kind of social prohibition or social disapproval of fidgeting that we see it as, you know, sort of tacky or gauche or, or shady. Like, why can't that person sit still? What's, what's, what's going on with them, you know, but fidgeting is actually this very fine grained way to modulate our arousal. Uh, and we can actually use, you know, scientists are experimenting with how different kinds of fidget objects evoke different kinds of mental states. So some may be some kinds of fidget, fidget objects, objects may be good for promoting creativity and others may be good for relieving boredom, you know? And so I think we should be thinking about these kinds of embodied self-regulation rather than having to muster, you know, willpower or, or self-control from within. It's much more effective to be thinking about ways we can do it from the outside in. Oh yeah. You mentioned something about grit, like the myth of grit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I admire Angela Duckworth, the, uh, the psychologist who introduced the idea of grit. I just think that, um, well, for one thing, I, I personally, as I mentioned, I'm so driven by interest and, um, and passion that I feel like if you, ha if you're forcing yourself to do something day after day, there's probably something wrong. You probably need to be in a different line of work, but also grit, uh, you know, we've talked about this brain as computer metaphor and grit rests on a different metaphor, which is brain as muscle, you know, that if we just sort of bear down and exercise our, our brain muscle as, as, as intensively as possible, that our brain will work better. But that's not really how the brain works. Often it, 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 it's better to take a break to, to move, to be outside, for example. And that is when people's best ideas come. So if you take grit too far, you, you end up in that brain bound mode of just, okay, I've got to grit this out. I've got to sit here until this task is done. And that's actually not a very effective way of thinking. It came to me in the shower. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, how often have you heard that? Right. I mean, it's, exactly. it's really, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's an anecdote, but it's, it's been repeated many, many times. <laughs> yeah. Something about, creativity happening, you know, sort of at the subconscious level, when you're not drilling down with grit to think about, to crack the problem, it gets cracked. In other words, the system is kind of running itself subconsciously and, you know, you don't have to do anything. Just let it go for a while and see what happens. Of course, you and right. I are not going to have a you dream like, a... Like, like Einstein had and, and, and come up with general relativity, but, <laughs> but that's the idea. Probably not. Probably <laughs> I was not. Thinking yeah. Of, and... uh, Oh, it's my friend. Oh, just uh, that, um, uh, my, my friend Art Benjamin. We have he a calls little this, here, I think. Yeah, yeah. My friend Art Benjamin calls this ADOS, attention deficit. Oh, shiny. <laughs> he he grew up as, <laughs> uh, 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 with ADHD, but he's now he's a you know a, a highly regarded math professor at Harvey Mudd College, one of the top uh, STEM colleges in the country, and he's the world's greatest lightning calculator. He does mental calculations in his head faster than you can do it on your calculator. Unless he, unless it's like two five-digit numbers, and that takes him maybe a couple minutes to do it. But to see him, so go ahead and Google and watch on YouTube or TED um, his talks where he actually does this. So he brings calculators, he gives them to people, volunteers come up, and they give him like two-digit number, you know, square a two-digit number, square a three-digit number, four-digit number, or multiply two completely different two-digit, three-digit, four-digit numbers. Uh, but to watch him work, it's you'll love this because it's it's embodied cognition, right? He's moving his hands, his, you see his face and oh, his really? arms and his steps and the way he kind of paces around the stage while he does these calculations. And for the big ones, like two five-digit numbers, so so you have you know two digits and three digits times two digits and three digits, so that's two five-digit numbers. So he, uh, let's try to remember this. He multiplies these two digits by these three digits, and then these two digits by these three digits, which he can do fairly quickly. And then he converts them into words or phrases so he can remember the, out, the product. And I then see. you have to multiply the two by the two and the three by the three, and then you add them all up together. So he ends up with like, say, one, two, three, four, five, six different phrases. Then he converts the phrases back to numbers and finishes the calculation. So the two five-digit numbers that are different takes him like, I don't know, two, three minutes. But it's just incredible to watch wow. him because it's a whole physical experience. <laughs> and he that has ADHD, right? He has ADHD. So he's fiddling up there, whatever that means. Or I was thinking about Temple Grandin. I don't know. I can't remember if you wrote about Temple, but you know who she is. And uh, mm -hmm. I do. Uh, 
Yeah. So, you know, this uh, this ability of her to put herself into the mind of a cow, you know, in, in a slaughterhouse or whatever, you know, and going down the ramp and the, the railings are right there at eye level. And this is very upsetting to the cow. So the railing should be lower or higher or whatever. She has that all that stuff. That's kind of an embodied cognition, right? Kind of an extended mind, her ability to empathize with animals, you know, and so she kind of her with her autism, she needs to feel secure like physically secure. She talks about this box, this box she had growing up where she would put herself in this box and squeeze the walls in because then she felt safe and then she could do her thinking like that. This is all wrapped up in this extended mind idea. Yes, yes. Yeah, I was going to say before that um, it that speaks to the importance of instead of, again, trying to muster resources from within, try altering the context that you're doing your thinking in. And that can be a much more efficient and effective way of affecting your, and improving your thinking. All right. This is all great stuff, Annie. Let's kind of wrap it up here and, and just kind of give us some words of wisdom about how I can improve my own intelligence, my emotions, my reasoning, my decision making, my life uh, by using the principles from the extended mind. Well, we've we've talked we've touched on a couple different metaphors for the brain during our conversation, Michael. That I think are inadequate. You know, brain as computer, brain as um, muscle. And I want to offer a couple different metaphors that people can use to think about their own brain. One is brain as magpie. You know, like as a <laughs> bird that is really assembling <laughs> their nest from whatever is available in the environment. And that's kind of what our brains do. We we build our thought processes out of what's the raw materials that are available to us. So that that uh, implies that the quality of the materials that we make are available to ourselves really matters. And then the other metaphor that I like is um, that the brain isn't a workhorse. It's more like a orchestra conductor. So, you know, I never want to be seen as saying that the brain isn't important to thinking or that it isn't central to thinking, but it's more like what is the role that we expect the brain to play? Do we expect the brain, the biological brain to do it all itself? Or do we put it more in a role of, you know, tapping this resource and that resource in a skillful way? And to me, that is a better use of the brain's abilities and will lead to better outcomes. Yeah, that's really good. I like that because in terms of, you know, how lives turn out, we're so focused on like intelligence and IQ or tech jobs or you know, this kind of individual thinking that we elevate uh, to this higher status. And yet there's so many ways to have a successful, happy, meaningful life that have nothing to do with being an academic or being book smart or anything like that. And even, you know, the, I mean, of course, I, I'm a college professor, so I think going to college is a good idea, but you don't have to go to college to lead a meaningful, purposeful life. And, you know, I, I think we we tend to overemphasize some of those skills just because of the structure of our society, Western civilization, maybe, or at this point in, in history. And, and yet that's so limited. I agree. I really agree. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, that's why it's so important to understand how thinking works um, and what kind of creatures we are. That we are evolved biological creatures who have limits, but we can transcend our limits. And that's, um, that's, that's the message that I'd want people to take away from the book. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for writing the book. What's next on your your plate? What are you researching, writing? Or... <laughs> uh, well, I'm still working this vein of the extended mind. Um, there's still so much to say, and there's more research coming out every day. I'm especially interested in this question of extension inequality, the idea that we don't have equitable access to mental extensions, and yet we judge people as if it's as if all that matters is up here. So I, I, I feel kind of radicalized by having written this book. So I want to I want to pursue the political and social implications of the extended mind. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, because that's a hot topic now. You know, the the, the idea of inequality. I mean, the mo this, once you go down that road, there are so many inequalities. I was just tweeting the other day about research on attractive people, you know, good looking Women, tall, handsome men. I mean, oh, my God, tall, handsome men win far more elections than shorter guys. They make more money. It's like, this isn't fair. I'm only five, seven. Okay, no. five, six and a half. <laughs> all right, all right. I exaggerate a little, right? <laughs> but if I was six, one, oh, boy. I, you know, okay. 
And, uh, you know, there's a, a hundred things like that. I hadn't even thought about the one you talked about, uh, about this inequality of, of just sort of neighborhoods and environments, but it, obviously. But what do you do about it? That's a, that's a harder problem. Yeah, right, right. That's what I'll be working on next. Okay, <laughs> that sounds good. All right, Annie, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for this super interesting. You're a really good writer, by the way. I, I, there's nothing better than oh, thank reading you. a good book. That, to me, that still that makes a big difference. Right. It's uh, and, and and by the way, it's not just uh, this is another one of my little beefs. There's not such a, there's no such thing as like technical scholarly writing and popular writing, which is the dumbed down version for the masses, you know, that anybody could do. You know, no, no, no. You know, being able to communicate in writing clearly in a way that's engaging, that pulls readers in. That's a skill and that's hard to do. Right. So and you did it. Thank you for acknowledging that. Yes, and you you do it too. So, <laughs> well, thanks, Michael.